Hello and welcome. I'm Pierruz Lamari Tabrizi. I'm the director of Sharmin uh, Bijan Musarrahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. <coughs> it's uh, my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, my uh, friend, colleague, comrade, <laughs> Manisha Muradian uh, today. Um, uh, Manisha is an assistant professor of uh, women's and gender and sexuality studies at Barnard College at Columbia University. Uh, she received her PhD from the esteemed American Studies program at NYU and an MFA uh, in creative nonfiction from Hunter College, City University of New York. She's a former uh, co edit the director of uh, the Association of Iranian. American writers, her essays and articles have appeared in Routledge Handbook of the Global uh, 60s, uh, Scholar and Feminists Online, Women's Studies Quarterly, Comparative Studies of South Asian and Afri um, African and Middle East Studies, Social Texts, and, and many, many other outlets. Uh, <clears throat> a prolific writer, uh, is also uh, a member of the uh, Jadalia's uh, Iran page editorial board, the uh, other culprit is uh, sitting right there, Nassim Mansuri. Uh, and uh, yeah, today uh, she is going to talk about her uh, book, uh, uh, Hot Out of the Oven, uh, <laughs> so to speak, uh, from Duke University Press. Um, displaying within Iranian revolutionaries in the United States. Um, this is a beautifully written book, uh, and uh, I can give away anything from the book. <laughs> uh, and I let uh, Manjie do all that on her own. Thank you so much, Manjie. So Thank much. you. Thank you so much, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really, oh, is this working? Oh, yeah, it is. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, Beirouz for inviting me and um, the center for sponsoring this event and all the wonderful postdocs that are here and, and all of you for coming. So thank you so much. Um, so um, the book, This Within, Iranian Revolutionaries in the United States, is a diasporic feminist reappraisal of the Iranian Students Association or ISA. So the ISA, for those who don't know, was a coalition of Iranian foreign students uh, that, who organized against US support for the Shah on and off college campuses from 1960 to 1979. It was the US affiliate of the Transnational Confederation of Iranian Students National Union, or CISNU. Um, so through CISNU, the ISA was linked to Iranian student organizing um, across Europe, other parts of North America, and also uh, in Turkey and in India. The book um, traces the journey of Iranian foreign students as they, you know, in Iran, then they came to the US, they became activists um, in the ISA, then they went back to Iran for the revolution, and then um, with the exception of one person I interviewed, all of them had to leave again after the in some point after the revolution um, because of their political views. So the, the, the arc of the book is the, is the arc of that journey back and forth. So it's a very transnational um, structure to the book as well as the content. Um, so I've analyzed the legacy of the ISA as a movement for Iranian liberation during a global era of anti-imperialist revolutionary struggles, as well as in relation to our present moment, more than 40 years after the Iranian revolution uh, that turned Iran and the US from allies to enemies. I've mined the history of the ISA for lessons that can assist in the unfinished transnational project of dismantling gender, sexual, racial, ethnic, religious, class, and other oppressions as they are constituted by Western imperial power and by successive authoritarian governments in Iran. Following queer and feminist scholars who have critiqued the binary oppositions on which imperialism and nationalism rest, I reject the gendered notions of freedom and unfreedom that undergird the US-Iran standoff and turn instead to look at a movement that targeted precisely the intersection of imperialism and dictatorship. 
When I say that my project is concerned with diasporic feminism, I'm referring to the analytical and political approach that I take to this history. It's important to be clear that the ISA was far from a feminist organization, um, and I have written in detail about its problematic gender and sexual politics as a kind of case study of the third worldist left of the era. Nonetheless, I argue that the ISA should be understood um, as part of a genealogy of third world liberation movements that created the conditions in which new forms of revolutionary feminism arose globally um, because so many women participated in um, these movements, right? Um, Iranian foreign students were part of that process. And this book attempts to grapple with what that means for diasporic subjectivity and politics today. Um, obviously, the book was finished before the uprising broke out in Iran um, last fall under the Kurdish feminist slogan, Women, Life, Freedom. But I hope that some of the concepts I offer in the book can speak to this new development and help us understand how gender and sexual freedoms have become primary rather than secondary demands and aspirations of revolutionary upheaval. My research methodology combined in-depth interviews with uh, around 30 former ISA members alongside extensive archival research. I looked at movement ephemera, campus newspapers, and mainstream media. Using what I call a methodology of possibility, I studied not only what happened, but also those ideas that didn't hold sway, the paths not taken, and the contested legacies of the widespread belief that another world was possible. So I'm gonna introduce some footage. Um, the footage I'm about to show you is from a struggle that the historian Martha Biondi, author of The Black Revolution on Campus, called the Black Power Movement's, quote, most momentous battle. And that is the mass student strike at San Francisco State College in 1968-69. And I'll explain in a minute why I'm talking about this, because it's not probably where your mind first goes when you think about Iranian students. Um, but this strike, of course, um, innovated new coalitional politics, uniting Black, Asian, indigenous and Chicano students based on the notion of shared yet differentiated histories of racism and colonization. Um, the ISA was not part of this third world liberation front. They were not advocating, Iranian students were not advocating for greater representation to, to address sort of the experience of being marginalized in the US because this was not their experience. Um, so I needed a different explanation to account for what I found in the archives, which was the involvement of um, Iranian foreign students. But first, let me show you. Um, the footage is actually from one year before the strike, and it shows a critical moment of escalation between students and the administration. Iranian and American protesters had gathered on December 4th, 1967, to oppose the arrest and suspension of six members of the Black Student Union and to denounce racism on campus. They marched to the administration building only to find it had been locked preemptively to stop protesters from entering. The crowd banged on the glass door, chanting, hell no, no suspensions, until ISA member Khosrow Kalantari decided to do something drastic to overcome the impasse. So I will play. This is from um, archival footage from a local San Francisco uh, news, news channel. So that's Khosrow on the left there with the with the beard and he's that's him kicking through the glass door and there he goes entering the building followed by hundreds of students who launched a spontaneous building occupation. <laughs> yeah, don't get any ideas. No, just, uh, who launched a spontaneous building occupation exactly as the administration had feared. Okay, so um, the college president at the time, John Summerskill, was so shaken by the militant turn of the day's events that he decided to shut the entire campus down, telling a press conference that the student's behavior was, quote, verging on civil insurrection. The student movement had entered a new stage of militancy in its efforts to undo the racism baked into admissions policy, faculty hiring, and the curriculum at SF State. One year later, the strike would begin. As it happened, once Khosrow broke through the glass, there was no turning back. 
Now, while Khosrow was not the only ISA member involved in the strike, um, he kept showing up in the archives as the only Iranian who became a recognized leader on campus and therefore a perceived threat. Oh, so this is a um, kind of iconic photograph from one of the mass mobilizations during the strike. And you can see Khosrow right up there in kind of the second, second line um, right behind the, the leaders of the Third World Liberation Front. Um, and this is a satirical leaflet put out by the strike committee. Um, the, there's obvi you know, obviously it's a pun wanted for crimes against the state. Um, and you can see in this list of top student leaders who are um, considered a threat to the university, um, Khosrow's name listed there. And Khosrow was actually arrested during the course of the strike and had to flee to Canada to avoid deportation back to Iran, where he would have uh, likely been arrested immediately for his anti-Shah activities. Um, and, and been very much in harm's way. Um, so in, the ISA, interestingly, was involved not just in this particular um, strike, but really in all of the major movements that mark this era as a high point of student activism and systemic challenges to American capitalism and imperialism from various campaigns against racism. Um, and this, is a, this was a poster made by um, the now quite famous artist Nikki Najumi uh, when he was an ISA member in New York City. And one of the main activities that ISA members engaged in was campaigning to free political prisoners in Iran. So they quite easily made the connection to working to free political prisoners such as Bobby Seale and Angela Davis, who you see in this poster. Um, they, they did that work here um, in the US as well. This was a poster that they we pasted all over um, New York City as just in the course of their ordinary you know, activities. Um, this is a photograph from a protest against the Vietnam War outside, um, in San Francisco. Um, and you can see the signs um, in, su in support of the Vietnamese, signs denouncing the Shah. And you can see in the way back, there's an Arab student sign. So this is kind of a, a, a little snapshot of how, um, how different groups came together around the anti-war movement, how that became a focal point and a site of affiliation for uh, many different liberation. Um, movements. Um, and the other area that I track in the book is um, Iranian student solidarity and organizing to free Palestine. Um, this is just one flyer of many examples um, of the ISA working jointly with Arab Students Association, um, doing demonstrations, teach-ins, film screenings, um, and things like that. Um, so I wanted to better understand why some Iranian anti-Shah activists participated in other people's liberation struggles, risking, in some cases, arrest and deportation for their troubles. Like Khosrow smashing through the administration building's locked glass door at San Francisco State, answering this question requires that we shatter many present-day assumptions about Iranian diasporic subjectivity in the US that have congealed in the post-1979 period. Rather than a narrow concept of Iranian identity organized around ethnic nationalism, nostalgia for the Persian Empire, um, or even religious affiliation, ISA members came together around a passion for fighting injustice born out of the lived experience of a US-backed dictatorship that led them to identify with and organize alongside many other groups of people also resisting state, state repression. I came to this conclusion through my research with print and video archives, but also through the archives of memory affect and emotion. Um, and I want to illustrate my process and share the major arguments of my book by focusing on three lines of inquiry that animated the project. Okay. So the first uh, research question is, what animated and sustained Iranian revolutionary activism and solidarity in diaspora? How does the study of the ISA in relation to other Marxist-inspired movements open up new perspectives on the gender and sexual politics of the Iranian left? And finally, how can we interpret the ISA's legacy in ways that speak to our present moment, more than 40 years into the US-Iran conflict that has shaped the contemporary diaspora? So, okay, the first question. To answer this, we first need to understand what forces produced the Iranian student diaspora, um, or what I think of as a temporary diaspora, because they came on student visas and expected to go home. However, for many of those who became activists, they could not go home, and so they actually ended up here um, indefinitely. Um, but what forces produced this scattering of uh, Iranian um, 
uh, university students in the first place. Um, and, and we need to understand the processes through which revolutionary desires, consciousness, and organization emerged from among the ranks of a relatively elite population. I mean, the majority of the population in Iran was illiterate in the 60s and you know 70s, right? And these were men and women who got to attend college abroad. So we're talking about a relatively elite population, although the class demographics did begin to shift in the 1970s. Um, okay, so I have a few terms um, that I wanted to introduce to address I'll just, I think I'll just put them all up, yeah, okay. Um, so I have four key concepts um, for this part of my analysis. Imperial model minority, a transnational process of radicalization, revolutionary affects, and affects of solidarity. Um, so to begin with the imperial model minority category. So after the 1953 coup, the Shah of course became a major US ally and Iran went through a period of rapid and highly uneven uh, so-called modernization. And this was a crucial part of the American Cold War strategy to win countries away from potential communist sympathies by showing how the spread of US-led capitalist development could raise living standards and bring progress to third world countries. The modernization of Iran was dependent upon the cultivation of a class of Western educated professionals who could implement and champion capitalist development upon their return home. In the 1960s and for most of the 1970s, Iranian foreign students were not uniformly subjected to negative stereotypes and discrimination in the United States. To the contrary, they were celebrated as evidence of American hegemony, as the very human agents that would enable the US to remake the quote unquote free world in its own image and further its own interests. I coined the term imperial model minority to expose how fraught and unstable this position was for many third world foreign students, not just Iranians. The imperial model minority is the transnational corollary to the model minority citizen. Both of these categories came into being during the Cold War and both aimed at assimilating non-white peoples into narratives of American exceptionalism and progress, though across different geographic scales. As many scholars have shown, US media celebrations of the relative economic success of some Asian Americans labeled model minorities were mobilized to rebut the searing critiques of structural inequality and racism made by civil rights and black power movements. So if the figure of the domestic model minority was supposed to obscure the systemic oppression that remained after civil rights legislation, then the imperial model minority was supposed to mask the harsh effects of economically polarizing modernization and state-sanctioned repression in allied third world nations. And yet the category of the imperial model minority, like that of the model minority citizen, was often overwhelmed by the very contradictions it was meant to erase. The process of recruiting and educating imperial model minorities sometimes went terribly awry, resulting in the admission of students who were hostile to US domination over their home countries. I wanted to understand how some Iranian imperial model minorities came to reject their assigned role in US Cold War expansion. So to do this, I drew on feminist scholarship concerned with the relationship between affect, emotion, memory, and the body work by Gayatri Gopinath, Anne Spekovic, Jonathan Flatley, Deborah Gould, and Sarah Ahmed, um, including others, among others, um, that looks at how hidden histories of state and imperial violence are registered within the body and can be expressed later in unpredictable ways. Which brings me to the transnational process of radicalization. In order to understand this, the process through which these privileged students became revolutionaries, I had to consider what the young people who joined the ISA had already experienced in Iran before they arrived in the US. When I asked my interviewees how they became political, the response was very often a series of memories from childhood, from adolescence, um, not a discussion of Marxism or any other theory or, or text or ideology. I listened to memories of martial law and the sting of tear gas, of relatives disappeared, of friends, teachers, and neighbors imprisoned and tortured. Farid, a former ISA member now based in New York City, recalled a recurring scene from his childhood in Tehran. Quote, we would see the tanks. We would see the soldiers in the streets. These were all in front of my eyes. And then the question, why are they doing that? Why are they there? So these formative experiences and the troubling questions they raised affected how individuals reacted when they came across subversive ideas or texts uh, or organizations, whether in Iran or in diaspora. But it was not only memories of repression that impacted this generation of Iranians. 
there was also a living memory of resistance, of various iterations of the long Iranian freedom struggle. There were stories overheard and passed down from previous generations who had experienced the constitutional revolution in the early 1900s and the short-lived socialist zones that sprung up in the 1920s. And there were firsthand accounts of the broad social and political impact of the Tudé party, the communist party in the 1940s, of the oil nationalization movement of the early 1950s, and of course, of the 1953 coup and its aftermath. Um, and there were memories of recurring rounds of strikes and protests throughout the 1960s um, that were attacked by the state. So as I listened, it was apparent that these memories were still charged with affect and emotion, even after so many decades had passed. Um, so this, this led me to the, the concept of revolutionary affect. So I read this archive of memories of life under the US back Shah for what I call revolutionary affects. Revolutionary affects are visceral intensities generated by experiences of repression and resistance that remain latent within the body and that can be mobilized later on. As the feminist philosopher Sarah Ahmed has shown, we might experience something that puts us in an affective state of unease, an incident of harassment, for example, but only realize later when we come to recognize the experience as part of a system of discrimination that we're angry about what happened. We also might want to better understand how that system works in order to make sense of how we've been affected. Coming into contact with others who share our affective state or mood can channel our affects in particular directions towards particular political ideologies and organizations. The sociologist Deborah Gould argues that social movements provide, quote, an emotional pedagogy, a guide for what and how to feel and what to do in light of those feelings. For hundreds and then thousands of Iranian foreign students in the US, the ISA became the vehicle through which they could make sense of affects and emotions that were out of sync with a teleological view of progress that hinged on support for dictatorship. Moreover, the ISA made it possible to do something about this lived and embodied felt discrepancy, right? Affect thus became a conduit towards new political horizons, new ideas about what kinds of feelings and actions were permissible and desirable. The concept of revolutionary affects refers to the sensorial material out of which a revolutionary consciousness can later be fashioned and to those affects that attach to and fuel the project of making revolution. ISA members expressed the desire for revolution um, in many ways, um, I'll show you a couple examples, hunger strikes. So they would go on these very public hunger strikes um, to demand the release of political prisoners in Iran or the suspension of the death penalty for people who had been convicted in Iran. Um, and this is uh, from Washington, DC, actually, uh, ISA chapter there. And they're wearing these very crude cardboard masks for which they became kind of infamous, actually. But it's to protect their identity from Savak agents. The US trained secret police force had um, in Iran, Savak had agents operating in the US spying on students. So they were trying to protect their identities and protect their families um, back home in Iran. So that's why they have these somewhat ghoulish looking masks on. Um, so hunger strikes, um, building occupations. Um, this was an occupation of the Statue of Liberty's crown. And they did what we now call a banner drop, um, where they, they um, drop these banners down with the Shah. And the other one that's hard to read says, free the 18. And again, this is about political prisoners in Iran trying to expose the reality behind the kind of um, the glitz and glamour of you know, the Shah um, as a supposed enlightened monarch. Um, and this is the kind of you know, propaganda they would put out kind of to try to challenge, again, this sanitized version of the monarchy. Um, they would mass distribute flyers like this that you know, be behind this um, kind of enlightened, um, glamorous uh, image was you know, torture, executions, right, repression. Um, so there was, a, there was really what can only be described as a relentless pace of organizing um, uh, for ISA members that, that could and did become all consuming for many of them and had a major impact in shifting American media coverage and public opinion in a more critical direction when it came to US support for the Shah. One of the major interventions the book makes is to highlight the joint organizing and solidarity um, that went on with other liberation movements. The example I opened with from the San Francisco State Strike is just one of many. Um, so rather than take this solidarity at face value as something that just happened back then because it was a time of third world solidarity, right? Um, I, I tried to actually um, I tried to actually analyze um, 
or, or try to try to push on that and really try to understand um, and get people to try to account for why they got so uh, involved in all these other causes that had little to do with Iran, at least in any narrow sense. Um, so I'll give you one example. Um, Jalil Mostashari, who was an ISA member in uh, the mid-1960s in East Lansing, Michigan. Um, he now lives in Iran, actually. But um, anyway, he described his student activist days in a very matter-of-fact manner. He said, the black struggle was part of the total international struggle for me. It was not only them. Sometimes the UAW, United Auto Workers, needed people on their picket line in Detroit. When Arab students had an action, we would participate in it. When we had an action, they would participate in it. Eritreans would come with us. Afghan students would come with us. Some people from Bengal, they were leftists. They would come with us. Um, he talked about being a member of the NAACP, the Muslim Students Association. He had like a list. He was a member of like 12 organizations that had nothing to do with Iran, really. Um, and I asked him, you know, what motivated this high level of commitment to many different causes far beyond that of overthrowing the Shah? And he looked me in the eyes, held my gaze, and spoke with the gravity of someone expressing a sacred truth. He said, quote, if you want people to sympathize with you, you have to sympathize with them at the time of their need. You cannot just say things. You've got to believe it really in your heart. You have to have this flame within you that can warm others. You cannot say it with your tongue. It doesn't move anybody. So the book takes its title from Jalil's words and from the description of the relationship between affective energy and political action embedded within it. To have, quote, this flame within, is to embody a politics of solidarity as animating energy that burns, warms, and moves people toward others with whom they sense something shared. I developed the concept affects of solidarity to describe embodied attachments to the liberation of others. And I'll just give you, um, this is from the Persian language publication of the Confederation of Iranian students, um, Donish Jew, meaning university student, and they, they covered the struggle in Vietnam um, with, with great zeal and great passion. Um, and one of the people I interviewed, um, Jala Pierre Nazar, she said that when the Vietnamese won, uh, she felt like it was her victory, right? Um, so affects of solidarity are generated when revolutionary affects or desires for revolution circulate and converge across different populations and movements. Affects of solidarity draw people together from widely differing contexts and facilitate joint political action across the boundaries of race, class, gender, sexuality, religion, language, and nationality. So it's important to say that Iranians didn't get involved in you know, trying to free Black Panther political prisoners because they experienced racism the way African Americans do. Um, they did not experience imperialism the way the Vietnamese did. Yet for each of these groups, the liberation of the other became intertwined with their own desires for freedom and thus became deeply rewarding. Affects of solidarity describe the affective state or mood that made third world internationalism possible. So how does the study of the ISA in relation to other Marxist inspired movements open up new perspectives on the gender and sexual politics of the Iranian left? So the fact that the ISA over time, like many student groups um, of the era, came to be dominated by different iterations of third world Marxism created a shared ideological framework with other, other groups, right? There was a kind of US third world left and the ISA was very much in, in relation and in conversation and joint organizing with um, a number of groups, right? And this was, I'm arguing, was something that was lived and felt as a kind of affectively rewarding uh, revolutionary imaginary, right? Um, however, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, affects of solidarity did not attach equally to all liberation movements. So I'm not trying to sort of romanticize affects of solidarity either. Um, notably, feminist and gay liberation movements were not common areas of affiliation and solidarity for the third world Marxist left or for the ISA. Rather than idealizing solidarity, I focus on the gender and sexual politics of the ISA as a case study of the contradictions and limitations of the third world Marxist left of the era. My research shows that the revolutionary affects of avowedly secular ISA members were embedded within social formations, such as gender, sexuality, and class, that were reconfigured at the intersection of imperialism, dictatorship, and diaspora. Um, so some key concepts that I use to analyze this. 
oh, okay, um, <laughs> this, this set of contradictions. Um, so women and men in the ISA were influenced by debates over the problem of what they called male chauvinism, right, within the left, um, that was playing out all around them in the radical student milieu, uh, within Students for a Democratic Society, within um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, within the Black Panther Party. These debates were raging, right? Um, the ISA formed women's committees, instituted gender quotas at all levels of leadership, and worked to recruit and retain as many women as possible. Um, the basic problem, as the third world Marxist left saw it, and I'm being really oversim oversimplifying here, but for the sake of time, um, the problem, as they fra framed it, was that you know the systems of imperialism, capitalism, and racism could not be overturned without unity between men and women working together towards revolution. Paying special attention to gender and sexuality would be divisive and distract from the quote unquote primary struggle against imperialism. Feminism was understood to be synonymous with separatism and therefore counter to the united struggle required for the liberation of racialized and colonized men and women. So this, I'm arguing, is a, is a kind of hierarchical and masculinist understanding of unity against imperialism. And it puts severe constraints on the ability of activists to understand and theorize the central role that gender and sexual regulation and oppression actually play in the workings of imperialism, capitalism, and dictatorship um, in Iran. At the same time, Iranian women were not just submitting to the will of male revolutionaries. Like their American counterparts from many different racial, ethnic, and national backgrounds, they had their own deeply compelling affective attachments to revolutionary struggle. They wanted a free and democratic Iran just as much as the men. <laughs> um, so they had their own affective attachments, right? Their own revolutionary affects. Furthermore, as the feminist scholar Minu Moalem has explained, the chance to become valued for one's political commitments and activity, rather than only for marriage and social reproduction, was empowering for Iranian women leftists. Empowering, but not liberating, to quote one former ISA member. Revolutionary affects imbued with desires for liberation emanated from the lived experiences of gender and sexual difference. And so in the book, I discuss, um, I discuss the, how this played out in the ISA in detail, um, how differences around class, gender, and sexuality were managed as sort of potential sites of disunity, how they were managed in order to maintain unity. Um, and, and there was, this was mainly through what I call an ideology of gender sameness, um, which combined with a set of practices uh, that the feminist scholar Paravin Paidar has called masculinization. So the idea was that among leftists, men and women were already equal. Like once you joined the movement, you were equal. Um, and women, of course, were eager to prove that they could do anything men could do. But the terms of this equality, um, the terms of belonging within, within the movement, what Anne McClintock has critiqued as a form of designated agency, um, were contingent upon women hiding their bodies within baggy clothes, cutting their hair short, refusing to wear makeup and jewelry, in short, erasing any signs of femininity in order to prove that they were serious revolutionaries and in order not to distract the men. So this was partly uh, a reaction against the, the association of femininity with the westernized bourgeoisie in Iran that was complicit with the Shah's dictatorship. Miniskirts, makeup, hypersexualization hyper and commodification of women's bodies were part of imperial modernity. And the category of the feminine was tainted by this set of associations. It was a degraded category, which rendered the female body a site of corruption of the nation and weakness for the movement. By covering up and adopting a masculinist version of revolutionary comportment and style, women could theoretically redeem themselves and reinvent themselves as revolutionary subjects worthy of respect. So gender sameness and masculinization were features of other revolutionary leftist movements as well, um, which shared an association of femininity with weakness, sexual objectification, westernization, and complicity with the bourgeoisie. I trace some of those connections and similarities in the book but the other important link was the idea that issues of gender and sexual oppression could only be resolved after the socialist revolution, right? The primary struggle was against imperialism and everything else was secondary. This hierarchical model of oppression was standard across the third world Marxist left. I wanna emphasize it was not about a quirk of Iranian culture or some deeply ingrained tradition. Um, <laughs> this was very common. <laughs> um, this was the dominant framework across the, the, the left at that time. So um, the, um, 
this, this framework would, was directly challenged, of course, by women involved in anti-colonial movements, as well as women revolutionaries in the US. And these challenges would emerge into new forms of revolutionary feminism that rejected a hierarchical model of liberation, known by the 1970s as third world feminism, and later as post-colonial feminism, transnational feminism, there's an there's a extensive genealogy, right? Um, in Iran, it was in the thick of the revolution that some leftist women, including some returning ISA members, began to fight for a vision of a free Iran that included women's liberation, not as a distant goal, but as an immediate priority, a necessary component of the self-determination and freedom which they had been fighting for. So the arc of the book, uh, as I said, follows ISA members when they returned home to join the 1978-1979 revolution in Iran. And I focus in particular on the women's uprising that began on March 8th, International Women's Day, in 1979 in Tehran, in which some ISA women played leading roles. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I have learned a lot about this from the chapter in Beruz's uh, book on this on this uh, uprising as well. So I'm very indebted to um, his research and analysis. Um, so just to summarize briefly, women had mobilized to denounce new forms of gender discrimination before they were enshrined into law. Um, and these are just some images from the demonstrations uh, of that week. I mean, the, you know, just just because this has been until very recently. Uh, little remembered, little written about, little studied, kind of written out of the dominant narrative of the you know, Islamic revolution, I think it's important to just, just look at the size of these crowds, right? Um, so uh, these women who took to the streets at this time when uh, in response to uh, the interim government first announcing um, that hijab would be mandatory in government offices, um, these women understood restrictions on women's clothing um, and also there were, women were banned from being judges. Um, gender segregation was starting to be imposed in, um, uh, in education, in schools as well. They understood these restrictions as part of a broader curtailment of freedom and as part of a reneging on the promises of equality that the revolution um, had, you know, had been so at the, at the core of the revolution. Based on my close reading of a French feminist documentary on this uprising, which is called Iranian Women's Liberation Movement Year Zero, and on other speeches and documents, as well as personal memories of participants, I argue that this was the moment when the revolutionary affects of tens of thousands of Iranian women who had been part of overthrowing the Shah diverged from all of the major existing organizations and ideologies across the political spectrum. There were a few exceptions, but um, by and large, uh, no major political parties supported these uprisings. Um, this divergence cannot be described accurately through a kind of binary of religion versus secularism because, um, as Beruz argues, there was remarkable agreement among the secular left, liberals, and Islamists um, that women's rights were at best a distraction and at worst a Western conspiracy to weaken the revolution. Um, and you know, the women here, it's important to say, were not marching against religion. Um, there were no slogans against even uh, Khomeini or against Islam per se. Rather, they were marching against the state enforcing second-class citizenship on women in the form of mandatory hijab um, and other restrictions as well. So the critique that emerged in the streets of Tehran in those early days of March constitutes what I call intersectional anti-imperialism. I'll just show a couple more images so I don't forget. Um, so um, I, I call this critique that emerged intersectional anti-imperialism. So here I'm borrowing from um, the black feminist tradition from a term, of course, coined by the scholar uh, Kimberly Crenshaw that really is embedded in a longer feminist genealogy that reaches back to, um, to the 1970s and, and even the late 60s. Um, you could even trace it back further. But if we think of organizations like Third World Women's Alliance, Combahee River Collective, um, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that's been developed by many other black feminist scholars and writers. And the concept comes out of the lived experience of women who had been part of broader revolutionary movements and who argued that gender and sexual oppression intersected or overlapped with racism, capitalism, and imperialism, and that real liberation would only be possible if revolutionary politics addressed that intersection. That was a starting point for third world feminism. So in the context of the Iranian revolution, we can see how an intersectional approach to anti-imperialism emerged within the revolutionary movement itself. When tens of thousands of Iranian women took to the streets, um, in the, like you see in these images, they were protesting multiple overlapping forms of oppression. 
the Western imperial domination over Iran, the Shah's dictatorship, and new forms of authoritarianism enacted in the name of Islam. They understood it was impossible for Iranian women to be free unless all forms of domination over them were dismantled. Their demands, unfortunately, were not legible within the hierarchical mode of revolutionary politics that dominated at the time. And I'm just wrapping up because I know I'm probably at time. But so final point, um, how can an intersectional feminist perspective interpret the ISA's legacy in ways that are useful to us um, today? So for me, the lessons of the ISA um, and its fraught legacy are many, but I want to end by emphasizing uh, two key points. Um, an intersectional anti-imperialism allows for a multi-pronged critique of gender and sexual oppression that resists the Islamophobic refrain of the West and the Islamist propaganda of the Iranian government. Um, Muslim women clearly don't need saving. I can't believe I have to say that, but I feel that I do when I'm in the US. Um, clearly don't need saving. Um, in Iran, as we've seen um, just in the past few months, they were leading the way towards a radically reoriented society. When Iranian women take off their hijabs, um, this is a revolutionary act of self-determination against a theocratic and patriarchal state, an expression of effects and desires for freedom. This is not a rejection of Islam per se, or spirituality, Iranian culture, or a wish to be um, a white Western woman, or a wish to be um, invaded or sanctioned or occupied by a foreign power. Um, if we reject the gendered binaries that have structured 40 plus years of the US-Iran conflict, we might find ways of putting struggles against religious fundamentalism, patriarchal authoritarianism, struggles for bodily autonomy, and gender and sexual freedom in Iran and in the US in relation to one another not as commensurate, not because they're the same, but because they're rooted in a shared affective response to gender and sexual oppression. The legacy of the ISA teaches that it's crucial to connect Iranian freedom struggles with a wide range of other movements for a better world. Um, the fact, oh, I'll just share my final image. Um, this is from International Women's Day, 1979, a poster made by the ISA. And it really shows this effort to um, focus on the role of women in uh, anti-colonial revolutions. This is the kind of iconography of that, of the ethos of that, um, of that era. Um, and, and this as a kind of model for how women were gonna be, um, you know, become free. Um, so the, the fact, just to, just to wrap up really, the fact that ISA members refused to go along with the Imperial Model Minority Program and instead leverage their privileged status to expose the brutalities of US empire in the Middle East is also a good reminder that diasporic subjectivity can be unpredictable and can veer off script, away from the reproduction of dominant forms of minority citizenship and nationalism. Rather than support the West against the Islamic Republic, what would it mean for our affective attachments to a free Iran to be linked to other freedom movements in the region, in the global South, and the West? Arguably, there are more obstacles to the flourishing of solidarity today than during the high points of anti-colonial struggle in the 60s and 70s, and we can talk about why. Um, however, I still would argue that carving out new transnational routes of affiliation independent from the states that rule in our name still appears as a most urgent task. Thank you. <laughs> Shall I sit? Oh, the mic, right, right, right. Okay, great, yes, okay. Fire, no, no, I'm okay, no, no, I'm okay, thank you. So we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, let me see this slide first. The postdocs do not have the priority. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because we can talk later, that's right, yeah. right, okay. <laughs> What do you think about like the imagery of like guns throughout like many of these posters? I saw like some of the earlier ones. There's like a focus on like guns, even though like most of their movements weren't so um, violent themselves. So like, how do you see that? That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, so so it's true. Like the ISA members didn't carry guns and they didn't advocate armed struggle in the United States. They were not part of that. But they politically supported armed struggle against colonialism, right? So they um, kind of um, unconditionally 
were on the side of these revolutions that were unfolding um, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, in fact, some members of the Confederation um, traveled to um, like PLO training camps. You know, they, there, you know, there were some people who were trying to gain training in guerrilla struggle so they could go back to Iran and you know start an underground armed movement in Iran. So a lot of them were supporters of that strategy and tactic and did try to even implement it in Iran, but they were not uh, using that strategy or tactic in diaspora, just to be clear, uh, right? So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I, the, so my question is about sort of like breaking the window and occupying a, a building at a university as part of a very local action seems to me very different than a hunger strike in DC calling for the end of, because yeah. I think kind of the hard pill to swallow is that the latter is ineffective. It's not doing anything. The hunger anything. strike? Yeah, it's not doing anything. Because oh, like, and so I wonder if there's kind of an awareness of the, a melancholy about the displacement. Like I hear it among today, yeah. I hear it today. Like yeah. I see my parents being like, and their, and their friends being like, we really want to do something for Iran. And they're in San Luis Obispo, California, but like six people standing on a corner holding signs. And like, I, I approach this with absolute generosity. No, I, get I it. understand where it's coming from, but it's kind of hard to look at someone and be like, the wish, this is a wish fulfilled, right? There's a fantasy here that at the heart, the root of it, there's disappointment. And I wonder if there's a reckoning with that disappointment yeah. in the archive. Thank you so much for that question. So um, I will say I did document at least three instances in which uh, the mobilization of CIS new members did um, either suspend death sentences or reduce sentences. So it's I, I don't want to totally say that it was completely ineffective all the time. Um, I think there were there are some documented cases where their activism had an impact in Iran. Um, but but remember, the main thing they were trying to do was hum kind of humiliate the U.S., Right. They were trying. They were doing propaganda. That's why there's so much in English, quite frankly, because they were actually trying to get Americans to put pressure on the U.S. government to stop supporting the Shah. So what they wanted was spectacle. Right. Hunger strikes with masks, occupations, banner drops, very militant demonstrations that would block traffic, get headlines. You know, they, they wanted to create spectacle. They wanted to make it so politically damaging and unpopular for the U.S. to continue its policy. So that was one thing. Um, but yes, they also definitely had a kind of um, ethical sense that like, well, we're here where we have the space to organize, right? We're not going to go to jail for having a meeting or a demonstration. So we have to use, I mean, this is what I, I love about how they, um, instead of kind of um, being like grateful to be in the bastion of the West, they used uh, bourgeois democracy against, you know, <laughs> bourgeois imperial policies, right? So they said, let's take advantage of free speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of the press. And they they ran with that as far as they could until they created a massive backlash in which they did get, you know, targeted and, and, and oppressed by the U.S. government as well. But, but so they wanted to use that space. They felt ethically obligated absolutely to use their privilege, their, their platform, their access, right? Um, so, and then the final thing I would, so I think, yes, the displacement results in a kind of ethics of accountability, right? We have to use our, our privilege and our voice. But the final thing I wanted to say, um, cause it's not in the talk, I always forget to mention it, but the final chapter is really about how former ISA members look back on what they did on the, on their, on their activism and their involvement. Because of course the, you know, the majority of the left did support Khomeini at least to a point. Um, and the revolution in Iran persecuted the left. So that's why most of the people I interviewed ended up back in the US, right? They had to sort of run for their lives in many cases. So um, what I found really interesting um, was kind of rethinking notions of diasporic nostalgia outside of a kind of dominant hegemonic framework. So if the dominant forms of diasporic nostalgia among Iranians are for the good life under the Shah, you know, what I found among former ISA members I interviewed was they were nostalgic for these high points of struggle, for these moments when liberation felt possible, for the moments when they felt a connection to um, to other activists, right? Um, like one member of the black, uh, this guy um, Hamid Kosari was um, a student at SF State. He was a member of the Black Student Union. They called him Brother Iranian. He was literally a member of the BSU. And um, not because he understood everything about 
anti-black racism in America. He didn't. There was an affective resonance with the militancy right, in, in the face of oppression, right? And he said to me, you know, I just wish I could go back to that time and like close my eyes and like never know what was coming, you know? So I, I borrow the concept of resistant nostalgia from Mariana Hirsch. Um, because I think it's it's really interesting to reckon with the forms of nostalgia that don't reproduce our dominant kind of nationalist frameworks or narratives of the revolution as sort of failure from start to finish, but that remind us that other worlds were possible, right? That history is indeterminate, um, that we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, so that's some of how I've tried to engage with melancholia and nostalgia. Yeah. Let's go to Shida, and then I have the last question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Manager. Um, I wonder, while this uh, ISA was forming and being active here and seemingly unified against the Shah, there were very different active Marxist groups on the spectrum of Marxism in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have come across any evidence in your archives or interviews of any connection to any of the political, specific political groups mm -hmm. uh, inside Iran and how that played out in, in the ISA. Definitely, thank you. Yes, there were specific connections. Um, I think um, first and foremost, the once the Marxist Fedayan launched you know, in 71, um, they had a huge base of support among Iranian foreign student leftists, right? Um, there were some organizations that did have direct links to people in Iran and other parts of the diaspora. And then there were some leftist groups that were like, sprung up in Northern California, like we're a uniquely Californian, you know, formation that then, but what, but the, but the important point is that the ISA becomes heavily factionalized. Pretty much all seri serious ISA members are also members of these secret underground groups and they're all fighting each other. Right. Um, so it's maybe a familiar story, but um, across the left, unfortunately, um, but and, and other and other ideologies, unfortunately. But the point is that they um, the ISA itself splits in two in 1975 over these internecine kind of factional battles. And the main question is, should the ISA be a broad coalition? for all Iranian students, a kind of corporate body, or should it be a revolutionary formation, right? Um, and that question kind of splits the group. Um, so, so yes, um, I, I do try to attend to those divisions as well in the book, thank you, yeah. I have a question uh, that uh, it's true that the Iranians uh, showed up for many different events, and uh, I wonder how much of that was reciprocated Mm. Um, and uh, you know, I, I always talk to old members, and and the way the ISA was uh, organized, the support for Vietnam, the support for Angola, the support yeah. for Eritrea, was basically uh, integrated into the organization. Mm -hmm. and it, it felt very organic, mm -hmm. so to speak, to them to be part of that. How much of that was part of those organizations? I mean, I know that, you know, yeah. rhetorically they say that, you know, I hear you, you hear me, we sympathize with you, we sympathize with me. But it's an interesting sort of phenomenon that yeah. why was the Iranian, to me, it sounded like mm -hmm. the Iranian student organization was such an exception mm. in its kind of internationalist approach <clears throat> and, uh, and their participation in other anti-imperialist, anti-colonial causes. Do we see any other sort of similar thing? You know, that I mean, I did find I did find a lot of evidence of joint organizing. So there were, like for example, in Northern California, there were very close relationships between student, Students for Democratic Society and the ISA. Um, they dated each other. They went camping together. They went to the same demos. When the U.S. invaded Cambodia, they all went out into the streets. They occupied people's park together. You know, so they were. To, I mean, they were in the thick of the same milieu. They were at the same parties. They were all hanging out at Iran House, you know. So there was a kind of. Did you say they dated each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, let me let me be specific. Iranian men dated SDS women. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let me be specific. That's the important part. But I'm just saying they were connected to other. You know, there was a milieu right of the left right in a place like Berkeley right or San Francisco. Um, so um, and there were also connections with like the Filipino communist 
group. They did a lot of joint meetings. They had relationships to each, uh, you know, with each other as, as fellow activists. Um, there, you know, there are lots of anecdotes and stories. What I don't know is like, because I haven't studied these other groups, did they feel that solidarity with Iran was a kind of organic, ongoing part of their kind of portfolio of sort of work? I don't, I don't know. Um, I've more been able to glean from archives and, and memories, you know, this kind of, um, where it just, it did feel like it was, um, very organic, you know, that they were just at the, in the same places having these debates and conversations. So. You know, I, I like that there was time. Do, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I do have a question. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, uh, from your presentation, it's certainly clear about the anti-imperialism and so on. What's less clear to me is, is when you refer to it as Marxist. Yeah. Uh, you know, given the long history of Russia's involvement yeah. in Iran, yes. right, from the early part of the 20th, right. uh, we can certainly see I mean, uh, the role of the Prussian army during the 30s and so on to help uh, support the existing government. I guess I'm less clear on when you use, and maybe, maybe it was selected, you refer to it as, as uh, Marxist, you don't say communist very often. Right. Right. And I'm wondering what their understanding was of what Marxism is. Yeah. Okay. At, at that point, Thank I mean, you. if they're it's certainly anti-imperialist, but being pro-Marxist can mean a number of different things. And I'm not, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I, I read a lot of so-called uh, uh, scholars referencing Marxism in very different ways. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, little agreement among the Marxists, and, yes. And, and <laughs> typically, you know, you, you, you could be anti a lot of things, and we've certainly heard a lot of anti things. Uh, but I'm, I'm less, uh, 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 I'm sort of in a quandary as to what was being proposed okay. as the alternative. This is a great question. Thank you so much. So this is, a, in part, a historical and generational question, right? So in Iran, we have a mass communist party. The Tuda party becomes a mass party, really, in the 1940s. Um, and the, um, there's a kind of uh, narrative that consolidates right, about the role the Tuda party played during um, the coup, during the period of the oil nationalization movement, when the prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, was very, very popular, was leading that movement, he had a very um, sort of tense, sometimes combative relationship with the two-dead party. Sometimes he banned them, sometimes he did. And But the 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 point is that when, at the, at the moment of the coup, the two-dead party doesn't mobilize its forces to defend him. Okay, for I can't go into all the reasons. And that kind of tragedy, that um, betrayal, as it's seen, right, um, marks a kind of break. It's similar to the kinds of breaks that happen in the West when, um, you know, the Soviet tanks roll into Hungary, for example, right? There's, there are these moments of breaking with a kind of dominant Communist Party tradition. And what we see really around the world is the rise of a, of a new form of Marxism. I think Mao is probably the major theorist, but also, you know, others as well, Che Guevara, Fanon, this is who they're all reading, right, of a kind of third world Marxism a rejection of both world superpowers, right? Which, as you said, Iran had experienced occupations by the British and the Soviets, right? So it's this desire to not repeat the mistakes of the past, which were understood to be prioritizing Soviet policy over what was best for Iranians, right? And so instead, there's an embrace of a third world Marxist um, anti-colonial Marxism, right? That's, that's formulated by people like Mao and and that, and, and that that's really what informs a kind of third world left, even in the US, right? It's not the Communist Party, right? Um, people are drawn to these other struggles, Greater Cuba autonomy. and, yeah, sorry? Greater autonomy. Greater yeah, autonomy. yes, exactly, to, to, exactly, exactly, exactly. Non-aligned movements and these things, yeah. On that beautiful note of greater autonomy, <laughs> thank you for oh, this wonderful you. presentation. Please uh, join me to thank uh, Professor Moretti. Thank you.